The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining me. We're really excited today to talk about a new wireless system called HoboNet. Uh, looks like we got a couple more people just jumping on here. So uh, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping stuff here first. My name is Scott Ellis. I am a product marketing manager here with Onset. Um, we are recording this, so uh, it will be available uh, after the presentation. And feel free to type in questions uh, at any point throughout this, uh, this webinar here. Um, I will try to answer them as I go, probably talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then uh, we will have uh, some time left at the end to go through any of the other questions. So what I'd like to do here is introduce you to HoboNet. I'm going to try something and see if this works, so bear with me here for a second. From farms to greenhouses to forests and vineyards, data drives better understanding and better decision making. With meaningful, accessible data, you can help protect your crops from climate hazards like frost or dry soil, minimize the use of water and the application of pesticides and fungicides, or improve the quality of your crops. Onset's HoboNet field monitoring system will transform the way you collect and view data. With up to 50 wireless sensors streaming data back to a central cloud-based weather station, you can monitor all your critical locations without having to run cables or visit the site. At the heart of the system is Onset's field-proven Hobo RX 3000 weather station, known across many industries for its easy setup, robust design, and research-grade accuracy. Our wireless sensors cover a range of outdoor measurements, including temperature, humidity, rain, wind, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and more. These compact sensors can be placed anywhere you need them, up to 1,500 feet apart. They use intelligent mesh networking to route data through surrounding sensors for the most reliable communication path. The sensors are easy to install with several mounting options, and they include a built-in solar panel for battery charging. You simply connect the sensor to the network with the press of a button and use the signal strength icon to position it for the best possible connection. More powerful than ever, Onset's cloud-based HoloLink software has been enhanced to make your field monitoring data more meaningful and more accessible. The HoboLink dashboard enables instant visualization of your current and historical data and can be customized to your specific needs with the dashboard builder and our library of widgets. And you can set up an email or text alarm so you are immediately notified of critical conditions such as frost or low soil moisture. The map view feature gives you a view of current conditions over your entire monitoring area. And exporting data or scheduling data deliveries to other programs is a snap. With the HoboNet field monitoring system, you can measure conditions over large areas once considered too costly or impractical to monitor. Now, with near real-time information and a wider coverage area, you can protect your crop, optimize crop management, and gain better data and more insights than ever before. Contact Onset today to learn how you can benefit from this powerful wireless field monitoring system. Okay, so there's kind of a, a high-level overview. What is going on here? We've got big tractors. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so that's uh, kind of in a nutshell of, of what HoboNet is, and really what we're going to do here for uh, this webinar is uh, really to dive into the details 
and uh, show you how to set up the system, uh, look at some of the specifications, and dive into Hobolink and some of the new features uh, that, that we have over there. So in terms of the, the system components, uh, basically you need an RX3000, uh, whether that's cellular, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet. You will need uh, the Hobonet wireless sensors, and then of course uh, you'll need an account on hobolink.com. At the heart of the system is what we call the RX3000. Uh, this particular model's been out for about five or six years. Uh, you can have wired sensors plugged into it uh, directly. Uh, great question, Ash Ashley. Uh, I've got that coming up in the next slide. Um, so you have an existing RX3000. You will be able to add on to your existing station. Um, but yeah, at the heart of this thing, let's say you do want to have a weather station that's uh, maybe centrally located, you can have uh, wired sensors plugged into that, and then uh, you can add in uh, the flex module for the wireless. Now, we do have three different uh, options here. The boxes are all $899, um, whether that's Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or cellular. Most folks end up using the cellular. And then we have uh, our different plans here as well. So there's uh, basically free data plans or Hobolink plans for um, the Ethernet and Wi-Fi. And then uh, for the cellular, I would definitely take a look at probably the $300 uh, plan, depending upon how many wireless sensors uh, you have connected to your network, especially if you're doing one minute logging, which is probably overkill for most people. But, uh, you know, if you do have questions uh, as, as you look at that, definitely work with our uh, sales application folks to, to size the best plan for you. So the RX3000, it gives you some flexibility. Uh, you do have the option to go out and get your own SIM card and install that. It's uh, AT&T and T-Mobile networks. Um, on the front of this here, we have what's called these flex ports, um, where basically you can plug in uh, the Hobonet wireless sensors, uh, either a four-channel analog or a three-relay module. Um, if you do need extra power for whatever reason, you can wire in your own uh, uh, power source as well. And then across the bottom is where the wired sensors uh, plug in with what we call onset smart sensors, uh, meaning that when you plug it in, uh, you don't need to configure the channel or anything along those lines. Um, the sensor is automatically uh, recognized by the logger. Uh, we are not compatible with Verizon. Um, and yes, it should work on the uh, 3G network in Norway. So just, uh, it, it would be with AT&T and T-Mobile uh, providers. Uh, and I know they have a list of um, worldwide compatible uh, uh, type folks. And this, the RX3000 is a uh, 3G compatible. The LCD on the RX3000, it's going to give you some information here. So when you are in the field, you do, uh, you can see what's going on. You don't need to be on your mobile device and uh, logged into Hobolink. Um, but this is really sort of nice feedback as you're, as you're setting some things up and potentially adding on uh, to a system there. The case design itself. Um, robust in a NEMA 4 enclosure. It actually has a double weatherproof enclosure where the, the electronics are sealed in another uh, case within the, the outside case. Um, there is a weatherproof cable seal, so you run the, the, the cables through the bottom gasket. Uh, and then in terms of all of this, uh, both of these systems, the RX3000 and the Hobonet wireless sensors, um, you can set system alarms and sensor alarms if something goes outside of range. And there is onboard memory on all of these. Uh, so if for whatever reason your network goes down, I never thought I'd say that until last March, the AT&T network completely went down when we had uh, 
uh, all the storms that we had here on the East Coast for about two and a half days, which was uh, interesting to say the least. So, um, but when the network came back, all of the data uh, got pulled off of the wireless sensors and the RX3000 and up the Hubble link it went. So nice to have the data redundancy there. In terms of the wireless sensors themselves, uh, they are competitively priced, and we'll get into get into the costs here uh, in a little bit. Um, it uses the 900 megahertz uh, wireless technology. Um, we selected this over 2.4 basically because it performs much better outside. Uh, it can penetrate through canopies and through trees and and all that other stuff uh, much better than than what the 2.4. Uh, gigahertz would. It, you, I, I'm going to describe this as a as a mesh or self healing technology. Uh, basically, it means that the sensors uh, can not only act as just sensors, but also repeaters. And I'll show you some examples of how we've got some pretty large networks set up, and how these are going to kind of hop through each other. The the distance line of sight is. Uh, about 450 to 600 meters, or 1,500 to 2,000 feet. Um, it also depends upon how high you have these mounted. Uh, those specs are having the uh, the base unit being mounted at about six to 10 feet. Um, we have seen distances uh, a little further when uh, you have those mounted up higher. And then in any one direction, you can have up to five hops. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of that. And then uh, in terms of the wireless sensors, so on top of any wired sensors that you, you may have already plugged into your RX3000, you can add up to 50 wireless sensors. I know that we showed before, actually I have this on the next slide, but uh, I will show you the, the, the joining method. I'll, I'll step you through our quick start guide here real quick. Um, it's pretty simple actually to, to join the network. Uh, there is onboard memory and they're powered by two AA rechargeable batteries with the built-in solar panel, which is the, uh, the black looking screen here on the front. Um, and you can uh, get alarm notifications. Uh, as I said before, this will automatically plug into your existing RX 3000. When I get over to Hobolink, uh, I'll, I'll show you. There's a firmware update that needs to be done. So, uh, yeah, Ashley, I'll show you where the firmware update is when I get into the Hobolink side of this. But anybody who has an existing RX3000, you do the firmware update, and then you will be able to take this and uh, plug it in into your um, uh, into your existing RX. Just taking a look at the the inside of the moats themselves. Uh, you do have the antenna up here on top. Uh, there's a button on the side here where you join the network. Um, you have an LCD, which is which is going to give you a little bit of feedback, as well as there's a couple LEDs on here. Uh, and then, of course, you have the batteries. Um, you can mount these a couple different ways, whether it's with a screw or we do provide uh, zip ties as well. Uh, there is a hinge or a, a padlock on here, so if you do want to lock these closed, you can. And then there is a grounding screw uh, as well. So, um, you know, there are some places where you, you potentially have a lot of lightning and you might want to consider uh, grounding these, so we do give you that option. And this is just kind of a 360-degree view of the wireless moats themselves. In terms of the different measurements, um, the, we have the wired sensors, or what we call smart sensors, on the left-hand side, and then we have the wireless sensors on the right-hand side. As you can see, we didn't we didn't duplicate everything, uh, but we did duplicate most of them. Uh, so there's temperature and humidity, PAR, which is photosynthetic active radiation, rainfall, wind speed and direction, soil moisture, soil temperature, and solar radiation. And so what we, we, what we didn't do in a wireless version uh, is leaf wetness, barometric pressure, the analog inputs, whether that's 4 to 20 milliamps or DC voltage, 
uh, or a pulse input. So if you do need any of those types of measurements, they still need to be taken at the RX 3000. Um, we are potentially looking at follow-on uh, wireless moats, but uh, not at this particular point. So how to join the network. So uh, Ashley, and I think uh, we had another question that was submitted beforehand. Um, by Mark and Brian, who both had the same same questions here. So uh, once you've done a firmware update on your RX 3000, uh, if it is recording, what you're going to want to do is stop it and then push the cloud button so all of your data goes up to Hobolink, at which point you're going to want to power down uh, your RX 3000. So it, it, it does need to be powered off. And then you plug in the RX uh, manager you run the cable through the, the wire port on the bottom, and then you power the RX uh, 3000 back up. And depending upon which uh, module you have it plugged into, it'll come up with module one or module two with a checkbox. Um, and what you'll do is go down and select uh, whichever uh, module the HoboNet manager is on. And then you're going to start join mode, which is uh, by pushing this eyeglass button here. Now it is important, um, just from experience, <laughs> you will want to join the moats or the, the wireless sensors near your RX 3000 first before you go out and deploy them. Uh, personally, I had this in join mode and then I went down to the end of my neighborhood and I was up in a tree waiting for this to join and it turns out I was actually too far away from a wireless standpoint. So it's always important first to make sure that, that the HoboNet has joined the RX3000 and it's, and it's on that particular network. So that takes one step out of the equation and then you can go out and, and deploy those. Uh, so to just, just to finish up the joining network here, you'll insert the batteries into the, into the uh, wireless sensor, uh, and then you will hold down the button here, and uh, you'll hold that for three seconds. And then step 10 here, basically uh, it's going to go through A, B, C, and D, and first the signal will start blinking, basically the, the HoboNet sensors out there saying, hey, I'm here, find me. And then once the network is found, uh, it will start determining its signal strength. And then when the X starts blinking, basically it's getting all of its information from uh, the RX 3000, like, you know, what, what sort of logging interval is it going to be and all that sort of fun stuff. And then finally, once everything is stopped flashing on the LCD, you will get a blue light that will begin flashing. Uh, and a little LED, and that confirms that you are now on the network. And of course, you'll want to continue to do this with with all of the wireless sensors that uh, that you have. You don't need to do them one at a time. You can just go through, pop in the batteries, hold down the push button, and then open up the next one and kind of keep going. Uh, and then when you're done, you just hit the eyeglass button here again on the LCD of the RX 3000, and that stops join mode. And then at this point, you're ready to go out into the field and start deploying these. And of course, when you do do that, you'll want to work from the closest to the RX to the furthest out. So taking a look at the specifications, I did have one question that came up, a uh, water level sensor. Um, we don't have that in a wireless uh, version right now, uh, but we do have a water level sensor that you can connect to the RX3000. Um, so we need to take a look and see if that uh, might uh, meet your needs there. So if, if you're familiar with any of our smart sensors now, um, the specifications are, are going to be about the same here. Um, I will talk, we do have a couple different models, uh, and it depends upon the frequency and where in the world you are. So I have a, a slide at the, at the end of this that will show uh, which models are, are recommended for which uh, areas of the world to use. 
Um, but our temperature uh, sensor here, this actually does come with a cable length of uh, 15 feet. Just keeping in mind that, you know, if you want to do soil temperature and you potentially want to get the wireless uh, uh, moat up above the canopy, uh, it gives you some flexibility there um, to, to do that. And that goes for uh, $189. We have a combination temperature and relative humidity sensor. Um, we definitely recommend, uh, you know, if this is going to be deployed outside, that you do put the sensor into a solar radiation shield. Uh, this comes with six feet of cable with an accuracy of 0.2 degrees C and plus or minus 2.5% RH, and that sells for 249. We have two, two variations of the soil moisture sensor. We have, uh, I didn't change my label. Uh, this is the EC5 and this is the 10HS. Sorry about that typo by me. Um, the smaller one, the EC5 is usually used for uh, smaller sections and uh, uh, sandier soils. Um, this does come with five meters of cable and sells for 249 as well. And then the 10 HS, uh, this is for larger plots. It's a bit of a, a larger sensor uh, and also sells for, for 249 and, and comes with uh, five meters of cable. Uh, we have our rainfall sensor here. Um, this uh, is available both in inches and metric. So uh, you'll just want to make sure that you order the, the appropriate one for you. Uh, and those sell for 279. Um, this is a, a newer design uh, that, that's come out within the uh, past year or so. And I can tell you the, the bird spikes do certainly make a difference and is helpful. Looking at the wind speed and direction uh, sensor, um, this sells for 389. Uh, and basically it's a, it's a combination sensor. Uh, you can um, screw it into a post. We've had a number of different deployments, so depending upon how you are uh, mounting this, you can either uh, strap it to a tripod or uh, screw it straight into a post. And uh, this comes with uh, two meters of cable length. And then we also have two light sensors. There's the PAR sensor, which is for uh, photosynthetic active radiation. And this is basically what plants like to see. The light, the, uh, the wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers that they, they like to see in that, that particular measurement range. Um, I've found that when you do go to deploy these, uh, because there's not a great way to mount this because the the cables coming out the bottom, I would definitely take a look at uh, getting our light mounting bracket. Um, so even though that's typically used with a tripod, um, I found where you can take that and zip tie it to a tree or, uh, you know, screw it into something. So definitely consider that. Um, that also goes for the solar radiation sensor as well. Uh, this is more for your general sunlight. Uh, it has a wider spectral range going from 300 to 1100 nanometers uh, and also comes with a, a two meter cable and uh, that sells for 299. We do have a repeater uh, and I'll show you an application here where we definitely needed the repeater. Um, it doesn't have any sensors built into it uh, it sells for $129, and it's basically uh, something where either you're trying to get further distances, um, you know, in between your where your monitoring points are needed, or uh, in the example that I have, uh, we were trying to uh, get the signal strength up a pretty steep incline, and and uh, we had to put in a couple repeaters to to make that happen. And then finally, we have the manager, um, which, as I said before, can be installed into an existing RX 3000 if you already have one. Only one manager can be installed per RX 3000. Um, and you'll want to mount the manager up as high as possible on the on your tripod or wherever you have your RX 3000 uh, mounted. And it does come with uh, two meters of cable and that sells for 149. 
battery life, we had some questions that, that came in prior to the, the webinar regarding uh, battery life. So um, as I said, this does come with rechargeable batteries and you have the solar panel, um, but if you're in a situation where, uh, you know, let's, let's say uh, you, um, sunlight is, is just not going to get through. Um, you have a really thick canopy and, um, you know, for, for those, you'll want to take a look at uh, doing lithium batteries. Um, or if you're in a, you know, an indoor environment, for example, uh, you know, let's say a lab setting where uh, the sunlight might not uh, get in there, um, you'll want to go with the lithium batteries. So the rechargeable batteries only charge off of sunlight, uh, not off of indoor light. So take that into consideration. Um, typically, the rechargeable batteries last anywhere from three to five years. Uh, you know, similar to a, a typical car battery. Uh, and then the two AA lithium batteries uh, last for a year at a one minute logging rate. So if you are going slower, they, they will last a little longer. Um, but we have uh, proven that out there. So question is, if I don't have an RX3, thousand or I would be buying the RX 3000 so is the manager still needed for the setup yeah so uh, the manager is definitely needed no matter what um, so whether you already have an RX 3000 or you're uh, looking to set up a new new system you'll want to um, you'll want to get that manager because basically that that is the the thing that is that that is looking for all the wireless sensors out there. So yes, if you if you, uh, if you are going to be deploying this in an indoor environment, uh, I definitely recommend getting the the lithium batteries. So um, they technically they'll work off of alkaline batteries, but your battery curve in there will be incorrect, so it'll show that it has a lower voltage. Uh, we also want with the lithium batteries too because they do stand up at colder temperatures much better than the rechargeable or the the alkaline batteries. So, but yeah, if you're using these indoors, definitely uh, get the uh, get the the lithium batteries. So compliance, uh, wireless compliance. What have we done? Where will these work? Where won't these work? Um, so we've gone through the compliance testing for uh, North America, for Europe, and Australia, and New Zealand. Um, so we recommend selling the uh, what we call the Dash 900s in North America, the Dash 868s in Europe, and the Dash 922s in Australia or New Zealand. Um, in some of the other areas, uh, such as South America, um, I would just refer to your, your local wireless guides. Uh, I've been told that uh, in some areas the 922 would work better than the 900s. So again, if there's some sort of local uh, wireless guide uh, guidance, I would take a look at that. Um, same holds true for India. I believe that the 868s will work there. Uh, when we get to Asia, um, that's where at this point, uh, well, we'd have to develop an entire new product for China. Um, for South Korea, uh, the 900 megahertz bandwidth is owned by the government. So we'd have to look at something different there. And uh, right now, the existing uh, sensors for Japan and Taiwan, um, they technically, you, there could be an issue there. So there's some things that uh, that their wireless compliance houses want us to do uh, as we're turning on the wireless uh, uh, signal. So just keep that in mind if you if you are in in one of those areas in in Asia that. Uh, you'll want to talk to one of our uh, distribution managers, um, but you know this this system would, would probably not work for you um, in in one of those areas. So uh, as, as of course in, in any other area where you know uh, 
we're not planning to do compliance, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions and uh, you know, we'll do our best to uh, look up and, and try to find what the local uh, you know, government uh, allows. So in, in terms of, that's kind of the hardware aspect of all of this. And now we're gonna take a look at uh, what we call Hobolink. And uh, basically this gives you 24 seven access to your data. Um, you can log in, you can set up alarm notifications, uh, whether that's sensor or system alarms. You have the ability to export your data. Uh, you can set up a data delivery. Um, and actually at the end of this, I do have a slide on what we call our API as well. So if you have something else, uh, uh, another server that wants to grab the data off of our server, you can do that. Um, we have recently added in Google Maps and a new dashboard, uh, as well as it's not out just yet, um, but we will have a calculated channel in the cloud for uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, specifically to begin with reference ET using the Penman Monteith equation. Uh, we will have other variations such as like crop ET will be coming out uh, in the future as well. So just a quick look at Google Maps. I will flip over to the, the actual web browser here so we can move around in it. But uh, this was a local deployment that we had here. This is a good visual. There was a question that came in that said, you know, what if I have like five or six greenhouses and, and you know, how can I uh, get these to come back uh, here? So uh, from this point here down to here is about 500 feet just to give you a reference. But they, we are doing temperature and humidity monitoring in all of the greenhouses and then in the fields uh, out here. So it gives you an idea of, of what the system can start to do. Uh, and then uh, I'm not sure for those of you who, uh, who currently have Hobolink, uh, hopefully you've had a chance to go in and check out the dashboards, but uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, taking a look at and look at the different uh, dashboards here. Um, this is just an example, but let me jump over to something that's a little more real life here. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so the nice thing about this too is, is that, you know, as you can see with this particular dashboard, we made this public. So you can get a, what we call a public URL so that you can share this UL with folks. And they don't have, they can't change anything on here except the time frame. So in terms of looking at some of these uh, larger graphs that we have down here, uh, if we want to, let's say, look over the past week, it just takes a second here for this to load. So you can start to see data trends and uh, overlaying, uh, you know, different measurements. You can do different measurement types as well, all on the same graph. So it really gives you a, a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility. Um, but but just a quick snapshot. Um, you know, obviously we're coming up on the cold season here in in the Northeast, and our friends in the cranberry bogs are going to start worrying about uh, frost in. Uh, Unfortunately, probably a couple of weeks, which is a little depressing. Um, <laughs> and then here's an example of uh, that Kuna Mesut farm uh, that where they're monitoring the uh, temperature in the different greenhouses um, and just looking at some of the trends uh, out in the field and along those lines. So gives you an idea of what dashboards can do. I'm going to dive into this in some more detail here in just a second. But um, when you log into your Hobolink account, you're going to see all of your devices. Uh, in this particular case, I have three RX 3000s. And then uh, if you weren't aware, some of our standalone loggers, the Bluetooth loggers, you can actually upload these through the Hobo mobile app. And you can start to see your data uh, in the cloud too. So keep that in mind if, if I've got any uh, Bluetooth users out there. But if we click through, 
This is a little overwhelming. I have basically 48 wireless sensors on here and almost a maxed out wired sensor system. So there's a lot going on. But when you first come into the overview section, you're going to be able to see what the, the most current reading was. You'll start to get some information about your wireless sensors, what they're seeing for a signal strength. Uh, are they in an alarm condition? Is there an alarm set at all? What your battery level is? Uh, you'll see here I've had a couple uh, sensors that actually uh, went offline here. This is a great example. I keep one in the car. Just It was more for testing than anything else. But what it does is it shows the power of, okay, if a sensor goes away, I can I, I, I get those particular alarms that there's an issue with that particular sensor. And then when it comes back into the network, I get another text message as well. So, um, and we've been doing some long-term uh, battery testing here as well, uh, which actually this particular guy is just coming up on 13 months at a one minute logging rate with the lithium batteries. So we're curious to see how much further this guy is going to keep going here. But this gives you an idea of, um, you know, what, what you're going to do uh, in terms of uh, looking at Hobolink initially. Now, there is the setup here. So we come into the general configuration where uh, you can give it your nickname if you want to add an image. Um, in terms of the, the readout here, as you can see, uh, I have completely exceeded my plan, but that's because I'm still doing some development or long-term testing here. My mouse is dying. <laughs> All right. Hang on one second here. All right, we have a mouse now. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so this is where you'd set in your, your calling interval. Um, in terms of your logging interval, uh, you would set this for your smart sensors. You, so all of your smart sensors, the wired sensors, can have one logging interval. And then if you want, you can have your wireless sensors on another logging interval. What you can't do is uh, set these uh, individually, the, the logging rates. So um, it would be for all of your wireless sensors. Um, one of the things that I definitely recommend uh, that you do um, is that you label uh, all of your uh, sensors. So for example, I'm not sure exactly where this one is. So we will just type in test and then hit save. And as you can see, this applies that label to uh, both the temperature, the humidity, uh, and the dew point. So this is really kind of key um, that you go through and, and kind of label everything. So as you begin to work in dashboards and as you begin to work in uh, exports, you'll know exactly uh, which uh, sensor it goes to which one of the classic things that we did was uh, we went out to the Kunameset farm to deploy these and I had a bunch of the engineers with me and you know this was one of our first um, uh, beta sites that we we had these up and running about a year and a half ago and we got them deployed everybody was excited everything was working we came back to onset I opened up Google Maps and I didn't write down where anything was. So uh, learn from my mistakes. So <laughs> if you do uh, go out into the field and you're not on your mobile device kind of uh, setting these up as you go, please have a cheat sheet with you so you can write down what serial number and what place uh, where you uh, place that particular sensor. Uh, because basically that led to us going back out into the field to uh, 
figuring out where all the serial numbers were so we could place those. And then uh, finally, I want to show you the alarm section here. And, and this is kind of a, a critical point here too, is um, these uh, system alarms default to on, but this also defaults to the, um, the main email address that you sign up with for your, uh, for your Hobolink account. And just make sure that that's a valid address, because uh, sometimes, you know, if, if, if you're looking at a missed communication or a sensor failure or the batteries go low, uh, you'll want to send that to the appropriate thing. You can send a text message as well. Um, and you can set up multiple actions. So if you have multiple people who are involved in, in um, uh, responding to alarms, uh, you can you can set that up, and then that also holds true for the alarms. So I went through and set up a bunch of alarms at 32 degrees and then at uh, 80 degrees as well, just really kind of testing the system. But uh, one of the things that I that I uh, do want to point out. for each sensor yeah so um, Jim I'm gonna actually point that out right now so um, you can set up you can set up multiple alarms on the same sensor or you can set up alarms for for all of the different sensors so um, one of the things that I that I do is I typically you know if, if I'm gonna have it go above 80 degrees and get alerted right away um, I do have this clear at a different value. And the reason why I do that is because there's the sensor hysteresis where uh, you would get a bunch of uh, alarm and uh, clear alarm events. So anytime this goes from 79.8 to 80.1, it's gonna start tripping. So I'd, I'd definitely recommend kind of putting in your own hysteresis. I put in five degrees because that just made sense to me. Um, and then of course you can add in the different actions that you have down here. So sending an email or a text message to different people, depending upon uh, who needs to get that particular message. And then, you know, if, if there's a critical action that somebody might need to do, you can put in notes down here, which will actually uh, come across in the email and the text message as well. So. Uh, keep that in mind as, as you're setting these up. And um, like I said before, let me just go back to the alarms. Uh, you can add, uh, so what was I looking at here? So I know I already have an alarm set up for uh, this tripod here, but you can come through and set up uh, another alert for it. Uh, to trip right away, and then we'll have it clear at 48 degrees, and it'll send me an email, and we'll go through and save that, and basically that save that out here towards the end. You can see that it's in a yellow state right now. Um, this will go to green or red, but when it's in yellow, basically um, the next time the RX3000 calls in, it will send that alarm parameter down to that particular wireless sensor. So that's just a, a real kind of rough overview of, of how to set up your system once you get it and you first start working in it. Um, there are user settings here, which uh, I've noticed that some folks uh, will sometimes scale their temperature data. You do have the ability to switch back and forth between US and, and SI or metric. Um, and for your exports, you can set up, uh, you know, let's say you want the date and time in two separate columns. Uh, you can you can do some of the settings over here. Um, we'll save that. So the next thing, especially if you're working with the Hobonet, um, is let's take a look at Google Maps. Now, this particular example, I've got this is at my house, and this is here at onset. Um, so we will head over to my neighborhood 
and take a look at this system here. And you can see that some of these are in red. Um, for example, uh, these have either crossed a particular threshold uh, or it may have a low battery. Or in this particular case, this is the one that I keep in the car. Um, and it is obviously not at the house today. Um, we have some others that are, uh, you know, this one hasn't cleared yet. It's still 76 degrees. Uh, the sun must have come out for a minute or two today and got us up over 80 degrees. But you can start to see the power of the system here. Basically, and my neighbors love me. They think I'm a little crazy, but it's all good. Um, yeah, let me, Jared, good, good question here. What did I mean about the mention of five hops? Um, and that's actually why I kind of wanted to come over to my particular system here. So I have these guys all spread it through, through the power lines here. Um, a good majority of these right on the power lines are mounted at about 20 feet uh, up in the air on some trees. But when you look at this here, here's our RX 3000, and we have one, two, three, four, five hops. What's going on here? And it looks like we got the redundancy just in case uh, it will go out to six. Now, it was raining here pretty heavily uh, this morning. Um, actually, I can't find this moat anymore. It's somewhere out there in the woods and it still communicates. I think it's on the ground at this point, but when it rains, it, it stops communicating and then uh, it starts communicating again. So at this point, basically it's sending all of its data back up. These are mounted in absolutely horrible spots. Uh, and this was done you know, on purpose by myself, uh, just trying to push the, the limits of this particular system. So, you know, that that's something that you want to keep in mind that, uh, you know, for example, uh, so as I was saying before, you have the one, two, three, four, five, uh, you know, technically I probably shouldn't have, have put these out here or what I should probably do is put a repeater out here. Uh, just to see if I could pick up the signal strength from from here to here. So as you're building out a large system like this, um, you'll want to keep that in mind. We were looking at another uh, network um, where some folks want to do uh, temperature uh, grids, essentially, and they were looking at about a half a mile in between each point. And so as we're scoping out that particular project, they're going to need to use a combination of temperature sensors along with repeaters. And at some point, they will get too far out where they'll actually have to add another RX 3000 into the mix to do. Uh, they're, they're trying to cover roughly 100 acres. So, you know, they're, they're, they're probably looking at about five RX 3000s to accomplish everything that, that they're looking to do there. So hopefully that... Uh, answers your question there, Jared. Just let me know if I, if I didn't. Um, but if you want to place these onto the map, I'm just going to remove this guy. Um, you'll hit the plus button here and come down and I'll find that one that came back in here. You'll just click or tap on this um, and then come over to here and place it. So one of the things that I'd like to point out, and I did most of this on my phone when I was actually out in the field placing these, uh, just because of the experience that I had before of not writing everything down. I said, well, why don't I make myself self-sufficient out in the um, uh, out in the woods? So taking advantage of this particular button right here, this little eyedropper uh, points you towards the location. Uh, and you'll want to just hit allow. And, oh God, for some reason this took me up to Boston. I don't know. It's because I'm on this Wi-Fi network here, so that's probably why it's a little, little funky. Um, but using that in the field uh, worked fantastic. So definitely, if you are setting these up uh, out in the field and as you're deploying them, take into consideration using this. Get your location uh, when you're on your mobile device and um, So, uh, good, good question. Uh, so the the repeaters, um, 
do actually go into that five hop count. So you couldn't have repeaters in between. So um, whether it is a sensor or whether it is a repeater, the furthest you can go out is five hops in one particular direction. So um, sometimes depending upon, you know, like my, my system right now, because of the rain, it, it actually found a completely different way home this time. And I'm cutting through neighbors' backyards and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, this this is definitely because usually these guys will travel down this way. This also this also shows the power of the self-healing network, where if there's a particular way that this cannot find its way back home, they're going to try to find another neighbor uh, or another moat to um, you know then get the the data back finally to the RX three thousand. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Can the repeater support more than one sensor? Yeah, um, definitely. So if you look at, where's a good example here? Whether it's a repeater or whether it's just a sensor itself, um, you can see this particular temperature sensor here. It could also be a repeater, but basically everything that I have in my backyard and uh, inside my house uh, is and in my garden, um, basically everything is coming back through this one particular sensor. Now, um, you'll want to make sure if you do get in a situation like that, you know, that does put everything into a higher power drain, especially if you're recording at one minute. Um, so you'll want to make sure that that is in a, in a sunny location. Obviously, if you're recording at a, at a slower logging interval, you know, you, you can picture it like, um, you're in a room and you've got 20 people yelling at you all at once. And this one person is trying to relay all those messages back to this person over here and keep things straight. So, um, so yeah, you can definitely have multiple coming into one, but, but again, keep in mind that, uh, the faster the logging interval, um, the, the more traffic and the more power drain that you have going through there. So that's kind of what we've got going on with uh, with maps here. Um, you can hover over to see uh, what all the measurements are uh, that you particularly that you have on there. Um, I realize I'm getting long winded here, so I just want to get over to the dashboards here. Um, so clicking on the dashboards, um, we'll hit my system here. Wow. Yeah, it came. We had a good rainstorm that ripped through here last night, some good thunderstorms and everything. So, yeah, we, we got some really good rain last night. Um, but uh, taking a look, let me just put myself in the edit mode here real quick. We'll edit the dashboard. There's a couple things that I have found that as we've been doing this that you'll want to take a look at. If you do use this gas gauge uh, widget, and I will show you here. You can you can simply add a, a a widget by clicking on it from up here, and then you click on the edit to configure it, and then you put in uh, the type of data that you want to show. So I have a combination here of uh, standalone data uh, for the Bluetooth loggers as well as uh, the HoboNet. So we'll go through and put this in because this is a should show me a good example. Actually, we'll do water content. So uh, when you go to change the format, um, this is where you're going to change your number number of decimal points. So it defaults to zero, but in the case of soil moisture, that does go to four decimal places. You can change your color here. So we'll go bright green. The min max uh, defaults zero to 100. So in the case of soil moisture, uh, it has very small measurement range. So we're going to change this just so it makes it a little more useful. And we hit save. So as you can see here, we now have this. And if you look at the monthly rainfall here, for example, what I probably should do is go through, if you do have a maxed out um, uh, widget like this, you'll want to go through and and um, 
uh, change that particular range. So you can also add them by clicking on any of, of these over here. These are all of the devices that are in my Hobolink account. Um, the Windrows is kind of a neat, uh, you know, a neat uh, measurement here. But this is a good example of uh, the Bluetooth data loggers in the cloud. Basically, I downloaded some data from the house this morning and uh, uploaded it uh, probably about 640 or so. So um, you can start to display, even though it's not coming in in real time, it's only as real time as you uploading your data. Um, but you can uh, start to get some of that uh, information into the cloud. Um, you do have a, a lot of flexibility on the line graphs. So if you want to have, and you can overlay different types of measurements. Uh, yeah, so here's a great example of, I have temperature, humidity, wind speed, um, light measurements, uh, all that sort of stuff on one graph. Uh, you can also have just, uh, the latest conditions here as well. Um, so if you just want to see a snapshot view of the last time, so for example, uh, a couple of these guys here um, haven't been updated in a while just because I haven't uploaded uh, the data from the, the Bluetooth loggers. So, um, But that that's, that's just kind of a quick touch on what the dashboards, you have the flexibility to move these guys around and really kind of you know, set this up any way you want to um, see it. And then of course, if you, uh, let me just hit cancel here. And this is where essentially you would, and you can customize a user URL as well. As long as you, it's unique and nobody else has used it, um, you can basically put in uh, your own name there and then uh, you can copy that link and send that out to folks to uh, check out that particular uh, dashboard. So, um, yeah, most of the parts, so for the RX3000, um, the question is, is, is the dashboard's real time? It, it's near real time. So the quickest that the, RX3000 can upload data is um, every 10 minutes. So you'll see these measurements change uh, typically within uh, 10 minutes as long as that is your calling interval. So for example, uh, what's this, 2, 230, 246? Yeah, so I've got a couple that, you know, I've probably got another scheduled call coming in. Uh, actually, if it's not happening right now, it will be happening shortly. So um, that's near real, that's about as near real time as, as we can do, and these graphs will update as the new uh, data comes in. So uh, yeah, they'll they'll definitely update as as that new new data comes across. And then if you are using the Bluetooth uh, loggers, for example, it requires a manual download. But once that's downloaded, the Hobo Mobile, you can then push that information uh, up to the cloud, and then it will get sucked into a widget if you have one set up for that. So a couple different options there. Uh, I know I'm running short on time here, so bear with me. Um, definitely load up the question line there if you, if you don't, if you haven't already. Um, I wanted to, I, so one question that came up in my internal training that I did here. So this is onset. We've got a 50, uh, moat system set up right here um, and this is all around the parking lot and everything and then what we've done is we've taken a second test system so this is the red square is is the first system and then on top of that we have a second system installed so the nice thing about these is that um, when you go to sync this to a particular manager it, it's not going to interfere with a second system that is potentially installed all around or in conjunction with uh, another system here. So, you know, if, if you were building out a larger network, um, so these two networks here, each 50, 50 wireless sensors. So we basically have 100 sensors here uh, working all at once 
to two different RX 3000s, just to clarify. It goes to two different RX 3000s with two different wireless managers. Uh, it's just an example of, a, of, of uh, this is the installation from the dashboard that I showed you over at the Cranberry Bog, where uh, we're getting ready to um, get into frost season and all that sort of fun stuff. And again, we've already taken a look at the Kunameset farm here. Um, but again, they're, they're looking at soil temperature, air temperature, and soil moisture in the different bogs and the different fields, and then temperature and humidity in the, uh, in the, uh, the greenhouses. Uh, this was my system. And here's just kind of how we've installed a couple of these out there using PVC, uh, basically slipping PVC over, uh, over some, some iron rod that we, we knocked into the ground. Um, this is very similar to how I have mine mounted uh, down the, the power lines like I was talking about, a PVC pipe that's jacked up in the air. Um, PVC seems to uh, do better when it comes to signal strength. Um, if you're trying to go for a really, really, uh, you know, line of sight and a very long distance with, without a repeater, so as opposed to uh, a metal pole. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, and this is that, uh, this is this installation here on the right hand side um, in Hawaii where uh, these ranges are getting upwards of 2,000 to 2,500 feet, but they're also mounted, you know, at about 15 to 20 feet off the ground, and it is true line of sight. There's nothing in between those things. So, um, you know, you, you can certainly get distances, uh, but again, if, if you're going to that, that far out, um, end of the range, you'll want to get them up higher and you'll want to make sure you have clear line of sight. And then finally, this was the one I wanted to show you where we needed repeaters. Um, as you can see, this is a vineyard that's grown on the top of a mountain and he has uh, grapes growing on all sides. And you can see this from up here where he has the weather station, uh, the RX 3000, and he's doing monitoring down here. When we first looked at this, we said, okay, this is fine. You're only going about 500 feet, not a big deal. But what we didn't take into account was the hill. And uh, it's about a 150 foot drop off from top to bottom over that 500 feet. So we had some communication issues, obviously. Um, what he did was he went through and he um, joined the network. So we knew that all the moats were communicating and then walked them out to these areas, and that's where they started going offline. So we said, okay, well, we think we need to put a repeater in here and here, and we thought another one here, um, but turns out it looks like we actually didn't need that one. So, uh, and you can see they're coming back, whether it's coming through a repeater to find its way home or coming through other sensors to find its way home. Uh, that's basically how we solve that problem. So if you are dealing with any terrain issues like this, um, you know, keep that in mind that uh, the wireless signal isn't going to go through the through the ground. So uh, the other question that came in before, uh, what we call web services or, or an API. Um, basically, uh, we used REST, SensorML, I believe we now have uh, uh, set up for JSON. Uh, I, I'm not a programmer, so um, I can't necessarily speak to how all this works, but basically you can grab the data from your web server and get it off of our web server and uh, suck that into your, your own program. So um, we've set up something for Weather or Underground, for example, where you can uh, send that information over. Uh, can the manager module interface with other existing systems? Uh, it cannot. Um, it's just going to uh, interface with our wireless sensors. So I'm not sure exactly what else you have going on there. Um, the other side of that is if you do obviously you have an existing RX 3000, you can plug that in, but it's kind of all of the, the onset hobo products there, uh, essentially at the end of the day. So. I know I've run about five minutes over here. Um, 
Let me just take a quick look back through here. Is it possible? Uh, is it possible to record the sensor placement using latitude and longitude with Google Maps? Christina, we haven't put that in place yet. Um, that is on my list uh, that I'd like to see our engineers get done. Um, we we haven't completely dove into their complete API. So uh, at this point, what I'd recommend is, again, if you're out in the field and you're doing this on your phone, um, you know, use that. Uh, use that location button and then, and then kind of place them from there. Um, could you use ArcGIS? Thank you. Uh, ArcGIS. Um, Betsy, that's a, is that a program? That's, that's like a database, right? Where everything gets stored or is, uh, good question. Um, you might be able to, if that's a mapping, so you don't have typo. Um, let me look into that. I'm not really familiar with that program, so uh, let me look into it after the webinar and um, see what the capabilities there. I'll follow up with you afterwards on that. Um, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. So. Let me take a look for for those. It's ArcGIS is the uh, is the the mapping program that they're that we're looking to use. Um, you know, this might be a good question for our user forum as well. Uh, shameless plug of our website. Um, you know, definitely uh, check that out. Um, so uh, that there's the community's definitely been picking up on the on the user forum. But I'll do a little more research into it for you as well. So. But it looks like I've gotten to all of the questions here. Um, let me just double check one more thing here. Deploying Grox connection. Oh, so this is this is another good question here that I missed. Um, if you've joined all of your sensors. But when you're deploying them, you've gone too far and you've lost the connection. Um, how do you know you've lost the connection? So uh, obviously, like I, I showed you on, on Google Maps, um, that the connection was kind of lost and you had those dashed lines. But what you'll also see is on the LCD of the wireless sensor itself, uh, you'll, your signal strength will go away and then um, you'll actually get an X. Uh, that will show up showing that it's completely lost its signal strength. So at that point, you'll either want to put one in between or move it closer. Now, the second part of this question, which I think is key, is, is he's asking, do you need to go through the join process again? No, you don't. They will automatically reconnect uh, once it's come in range of the rest of the system. So, And that's kind of what I'm doing with the one that I have in the car. So every day it leaves the house, it's in the car, it loses the network, and then when it comes back, uh, it rejoins the network, sends up all the data that it's stored over the eight or nine, ten hours I was here, and then uh, and then begins um, you know sending data in real time again. Okay, great feedback. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess the I guess the video wasn't. I, I was trying with the video. They uh, go to has just come out with a new feature that I was trying, so I figured I'd give it a shot. But uh, I will send out the link to the video. That is right off of our website as well. If you wanted to uh, just take a look at that, I'll show you where that is. That's right here. If you click on Meet Hobonet, and then scroll down, and the video is right here, so that will uh, pop up there for you. So, but we will. Uh, I'll send out a link to that in the follow-up as well. So, um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time. Sorry for uh, going a little little overboard here. Uh, as I said, here is my contact information. Um, definitely reach out to our 
product application specialists. Uh, you know, if you have any questions and if you do any of that social media fun stuff, you can find us out there. So uh, thank you again. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to, you know, hearing more questions and, and seeing more of these out in the field. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.